This is an RNZ podcast. Howdy, y'all. Kia ora koutou. Welcome to this week's The Long Way Home, a podcast series during which I rave on about my experiences of attempting to walk from Cape Reinga to Bluff, the length of New Zealand, 3,000 kilometres on what's called Tararoa Trail. So this is the Tararoa Trail and my attempt to walk it. It's turned into a bit of a bloody jigsaw puzzle. I've been back in Auckland for my son Joe and Millie's wedding, his partner Millie's wedding. They're they are the couple who have blessed me with three wonderful grandchildren, Charlie, Gracie and Freddie. And I'm sitting with my mother. She came down for the wedding. Mum's brought me some some of Dad's ashes. <laughs> Sorry about that, Ma. Well, you had to have something, seeing we couldn't find the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my sister-in-law, Joelle, has... She had kept some of my brother's ashes, so I've got some more of his ashes to uh, load up for myself as well, which is fantastic. And of course, I'm walking them back to Stewart Island, and it is my mother here, Coe, Colleen Marguerite Hopkins, who uh, was the third generation Stewart Islander, thus making me, my brother Doug, and my two sisters, Lindley and Wanda, fourth generation Stewart Islanders when we were born to mum and dad down on the island. But that was... Um, you know, Mum, that must have been an unreal experience growing up on the island. What Did you think there was a world outside of Stewart Island as a kid? Well, I remember the, we had a captain on the ferry boat of those days who didn't have a family and he was terribly good to children on Stewart Island and he went one day when he took the older children at the school to Bluff uh, back again that afternoon to Stewart Island and he said he could always remember my eldest sister standing there saying... Oh, gosh, I never knew there was another world. <laughs> <laughs> Big Nan, your mum, we, we called her Big Nan, we called Dad's mum Wee Nan, and, um, and your dad, uh, they, they both passed away really at a really young age. And What was their... How did they come to be on the island? Um, well, my mother came from the Johnson family who had the fishing around Horseshoe Bay. They owned the uh, fishing rights of the shed and they had a shed and everything there. And the boys went fishing and the day off when the girls didn't have to work in the fish, uh, doing anything in the fish shed, they um, also went out in dinghies or something like that and fished. And then my father came over from uh, Hokitika Way, where he'd lived, and he came there to work at Stewart Island and that's where he met Mum. And both of my aunties, then they married Norwegian whalers. The Norwegians had uh, come to uh, uh, Patterson's Inlet at the top. They had their uh, station there. And my father went down to the Ross Sea for two years of the uh, whaling season with them. And uh, uh, him and mum had met and married, and then my, other, and my other two aunties married the Norwegian men. And then, uh, of course, that that's reflected in you and Dad, because Dad came to the island, much like your father came to the island, mm. and married a local. He was from Catlins, and he had left school to work. I think he first worked in a mill, and um, then he went to Dunedin to take a trade up, and he didn't like that, and went back to fishing out of um, oh, I can't quite remember where he fished from, uh, out of the Catlins area, and then he came to Stewart Island with his two brothers, and they all got caught. Instead of catching fish, they got caught by the Stewart Island woman. <laughs> and uh, they stayed there, and my sister married my husband's brother, and she still lives there now, and her family are there now, and we, of course, had moved away. And um, we sort of broke the tradition of the island because we'd moved away from there, but um, anyway. So so did it? what was it like for you having to live away from the island, you know, because we moved up to Russell? Um, I used to think of Stewart Island, but we sort of got involved up in Russell and it seemed all right, but I did miss my family and uh, my father had died. He died at the age of 50 and my mother wasn't very well and um, we, so we went down one part when we lived in Russell for a trip 
and uh, we'd gone down with the family and lived down. So we stayed. We went for a trip and we stayed three months. Bill went back possum trapping with a friend, and um, we felt we could move back there. We just sort of felt at home. But by then our kids were saying to us, "Oh, where's our friend in Russell? When are we going back to Russell?" And we said, "Oh, we better go back, I suppose." And that sort of we felt quite at home that we were back there again. But now let's go to childbirth. You gave birth to us four kids while you were living on Stewart Island. Only Wanda um, was was born on the island. The, um, Doug Lindley and myself were born, of course, in Invercargill yeah. Hospital. Tell us about a trip when you, you know, like what was that like when you you felt that you were about to give birth, and you had to get on a bloody fishing boat to go yeah. to Invercar to Bluff and then Invercargill. What was that like? Well, when we didn't we didn't have a doctor at Stewart Island. Of course, one would come every month, perhaps once a month. Something like that, and so um, I said we were sent to Invercargill to have our children um, about two weeks before we actually were due, and I was going away, Bill's away fishing, and my mother was a bit worried about me. She got a young girl to come and stay with me overnight, and I had to call her early hours in the morning and tell her that I was having a baby, and um, she ran down and got the nurse, and they got in touch with my mother and family and they all come up and um, she said there was only about one fishing boat that could take me and that was my uncle. The other boats were all away fishing. And um, anyway, then she said I didn't have time to go so she'd have to perform and I'd have the baby at home. So I did. I had um, one of the children wander at home at Stewart Island and she went for her passport to go overseas one year, a few years back, of course, that was. And uh, the woman by the counter said, oh, but I've never had anybody who's ever been born on Stewart Island. This is a really first for me. <laughs> and it was quite funny. But to my uncle had said his was the boat, and he said, oh, gosh, I'm glad I didn't have to take you. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed with people I knew in Invercargill until it was time to go into the nursing home. And um, Bill, of course, would come over after the child was born, but... When he was away fishing, we were having something altered at the house and um, he got in touch to say he was fishing with somebody else but um, they would bring the boat back and bring him home if I needed him. And I said, well, he had no bed to sleep in, so he better just stay out fishing. And I was fine. My mother had found a retired nurse and she came and lived in. We put the children out among the rest of the family and uh, she stayed with me until Bill came in from fishing, which was about a week later, and looked after me. Give us an idea of what it was like to be a kid growing up on Stewart Island. What, what sort of stuff did you get up to? Oh, well, we had a normal school like everybody else did and we had the beach in front of it. And um, we just thought it was just a way of life. And I remember when the war started, though, um, that they trained us at school to, in case we got over, in case the place was invaded um, and we had to escape from the school and the boys had to help the girls out the back window. And we had to go out a ditch, go or creep out a ditch through a roadway. We went away up the road and went hidden away mainly in the ditch and walked up the road. And then a boy on a bicycle would come up and the all clear would be sounded and we would be brought back to the school. <laughs> the boys thought this was good fun, heaving us out the windows. It doesn't matter if we fell over, they thought it was good fun. And we, we were up there, we kept saying, how long do we have to stay here? And the, suddenly this chap appeared and he said, why didn't you come when we sent the word out that all cleared? And we said, we never heard you. <laughs> we were so far up the road. <laughs> the systems needed a bit of tweaking. So, and what, what did you do for fun, like, um, as kids? On, how, many, like, how many kids were there on the island when you were growing up? I don't, I'm not sure, really sure, but the population always has been around 400 people uh, mm. who actually live on the island and they would come over for holidays. And we always thought those ones that came over for holidays, we said they were very snobby, of course. They could come for holidays and stay at a place and we thought they were all snobs. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we just, I don't know, I suppose we went to beaches and we used to, I can remember stabbing poor little flounder with a bent-out pin in the creek <laughs> on the beach and we thought we should cook them <laughs> and things like that. We, and I had a grandmother who always had a pet cow and my mother milked it and we'd go around with her for a walk. She milked the cow and things. I don't know, we just lived a life as we, we had our little batches in the paddocks and things like that. We'd go after school, we'd go and 
boys weren't allowed, just girls <laughs> were allowed to go to our little um, batches in the <laughs> paddock. <laughs> and, you know, like everything has to be essentially food-wise other than what you can catch or hunt on the island because there wasn't a lot of veg. you know, you couldn't grow vegetables very well unless you had a good hothouse or something. But So what, what was the kind of favourite food down there? Well, in those days, actually, my father did have a very good vegetable garden. And um, when we got married and finally got our own home, my husband made a very good vegetable garden too for us. But um, we just used to wait till the ferry boat came in and rush off for our bread. And anything that was fresh, of course, would come over in the ferry boat. And when I went to the Chathams, I realised, though, I sat and wrote a list of what I would buy at the shop down there and my husband watched me write it and went to the shop with me. And, of course, everything I asked for, I couldn't get. And he burst out laughing, and I, all the time he'd watch me write the list and knew I wouldn't be able to buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, and so I didn't think we were so bad off after all. <laughs> we had coal, of course, for our fires, and we always had the only truck we had on Stewart Island. When I was young, well, eventually they got a truck for the, carrying the coal and there wasn't a car to be seen on the island itself. And um, then there was a man who had a holiday place there and uh, he bought a Land Rover over to get round in and then um, a Mr Turner from England who came and bought a house at Stewart Island and he eventually bought a Land Rover uh, to go to around in as well and we thought this was really something to see them on the road. Now you go down there and the road doesn't belong to you hardly. <laughs> it's all the tourists that go to Stewart Island. So now I'm um, just finally like I'm doing this symbolically taking, you know, Dad and Doug, walking them back from where we used to be cray fishermen off Cape de Anger and which was pretty special in itself, and walking them back to Stewart Island where we're from, which is to me the most special thing. What do you reckon Dad and Doug would think of me doing this if they if they were still around? Do you reckon they'd be think I'm a stupid bugger? <laughs> I don't know, or knowing Dad, he'd probably say, what the hell do you think you're doing? And um, Doug would probably say, you know, what are you doing that for, or something like that. But deep down, I think they would feel pretty good about it. Like I, you know, I said to him, what on earth do you think you're doing? But I do feel he is doing something that I'm proud of him and that he wants to do, and he should do it if he feels like it. Thing I'd like to add at this point in time, a little point I'd like to touch on is I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the many, many people. It's quite mind-blowing how many people approach me via uh, social media and, and comment on the podcast, The Long Way Home, uh, po- positively, which is always very, very nice to hear. I feel like I'm such an amateur at it, but but also in person. I, I'm blown away how many people come up to me in person. And I just had a guy, Campbell, I was up at a food hall with my mother and sister having um, a little chow down before they head off tomorrow. And Campbell comes up to me and just says how much he wanted to thank me for sharing my journey and my um, story. He He lost his brother at 19 years of age. In a motorcycle accident, and he said he's just he's never really known, you know, like the, the the way to deal with it. You never know. There's no guidance on how to deal with uh, losing a sibling, etc. So, and he's found the podcasts have been really uh, helpful in terms of him coming to terms with his own uh, situations. So, thank you so much, you guys. Like that's it. It makes it's amazing. Yeah, it's humbling. It's a privilege to be doing this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Bruce. All right, this is um, Bruce. On behalf of Bruce, Bruce and all the Bruces, signing off for another week. The jigsaw puzzle is getting... There are more pieces in the jigsaw puzzle now. So uh, I've got to get myself all cleared up to head into the isolated and very challenging sections of the trail that are yet to come. 
I thought I've already done some bloody challenging bits, but no, there's more. But wait, there's more. Catch you later. The Long Way Home is produced by Bruce Hopkins and Justin Gregory. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. The engineer is Jeremy Veal. Subscribe to every episode of The Long Way Home podcast at iTunes or at radionz.co.nz forward slash series. And while you're there, please rate us. That way more people get to hear these stories. If you go to the Long Way Home webpage at rnz.co.nz, you'll find an interactive map that follows Bruce as he walks to Aotearoa. Bruce is also on Twitter, at Bruce Hop, so get in touch if you've got tips, questions, or can offer him a beard, a meal, or just a hot shower along the way. You can also email him at thelongwayhome at radionz.co.nz. In the next episode, Bruce will be back on the trail between Otaki and Wellington, having skipped the rugged Tararua section. That's for a bit later on. The Long Way Home. Whenua, Whakapapa, Fano. Follow us. <laughs>